All right, folks, welcome to the Monsters Madness and Magic Podcast. I'm your host, Justin, here with a quick word before we dive in. Now, in this episode, I chat with actor Amos Crawley about the acting scene in Toronto in the early 90s, Goosebumps, the ghastly grinner, riding the magic school bus, and more. As always, thank you all for listening out there, and if you happen to be listening on your podcasting platform of choice and you'd like to help the show grow, please leave us a review, and if you happen to be watching the video on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe because it does help. Anyway, without further ado, here you go. Amos, take us back in time. You're a youngster. Are you a book reader, fort builder, troublemaker, or all of the above? Uh, book reader. I got nothing against the fort, and I got into tr- <laughs> and I got into troublemaking later in life. But, <laughs> but I would say, as a youngster, book reader. Did you have a genre or maybe a favorite writers that you lean towards? So we're talking about like Goosebumps era, right? Yeah, when you're growing up, uh, whatever you're picking up at school or anything like yeah. that. Yeah, I'm gonna say uh, early on, like once you get out of like kids' books and stuff. Yeah, I remember. Like really, uh, like Douglas Adams was big, you know, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was big, and then and then around twelve, thirteen, uh, Kurt Vonnegut mm. came in. Slaughterhouse Five came into my life, um, uh, and then and you know like a little Stephen King and uh, a little, uh, you know, kind of that basic gamut that I think most kids sort of go through. The the one that I never I could never do Tolkien. Much mm. to, you know, my, my brother loved it and I just couldn't. I was like, man, this is a lot of descriptions of trees. I don't know if I can do it. <laughs> but other than that, your basic kind of like, uh, uh, you know, little nerdy, little weirdo uh, library list that everybody else had, you know, Neil Gaiman, Sandman. Mm. And uh, yeah, that the good stuff. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so whereabouts did you grow, by the way? I grew up in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, uh, um, and and uh, like right downtown. I was a downtown kid. I don't know if you know Toronto or if your listeners know Toronto, but I grew up thinking Toronto was about four square miles. <laughs> um, it was the four square miles that, that I could get to by subway. Right. And, uh, <laughs> anything beyond that, I assumed was farmland. But still, still in Toronto. Uh, I live about an hour outside of Toronto now. Okay, gotcha. So were either your parents, were they creatively inclined at all? Do you think that's where your, the inspiration came from a bit? So both my parents were performers. Um, mm-hmm. My father was a, a musician and an actor. My mother was an actor. Uh, my grandparents were filmmakers. Um, my brother did um, uh, sound and uh, post-video editing. My sister did hair and makeup on sets. Man. I didn't... I didn't meet anybody who had a real job till I was in my twenties. <laughs> you didn't have a choice then. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so uh, when you think back to formative films and TV shows that you grew up on and specifically what comes to mind? Well, I guess the easiest way to answer is to talk about the ones that I like get excited to watch with my kids. Yeah. So like back to the future, uh, labyrinth, um, uh, uh, this is Spinal Tap. I love when I was kids. <laughs> That's a good. It was one. like one of those. Like I think we rented a cottage one year or something, and and it rained the whole summer, and and I had like three VHSs, and This is Spinal Tap is one of them. So I just watched it like, you know, twenty <laughs> times that summer. Yeah. And uh, and then I remember going back and watching it again as an adult, and realizing how many of the jokes I didn't get as a kid. <laughs> um, but I still really liked it a lot. Uh, yeah, those are the ones that sort of pop into my head. Um, you know, the Indiana Jones movies, especially the last one, or what I call the last one. I know there've been a couple since, but they they don't they don't count. I don't know. What about you? What were some of yours? I mean, you're nailing it too. I like the. Uh, it, you're, it seems like you like all the movies with the the childlike sense of wonder and adventure, kind of because Spielberg almost has a Ray Bradbury feel, and that's what I like reading. Okay. So, so yeah, that's that's kind of my stuff too. Also, a Stand by Me, Stephen King, but same right. kind of coming of yeah, age yeah, yeah. type thing. I love that stuff too. I loved. I remember the Stand by Me soundtrack. I had that on cassette, 
and I had one of those yellow Walkmans. Yeah. Um, like the, the Walkman Sport. Was, uh, <laughs> for those of you who were alive in the 1980s, it was a big deal. And uh, I remember listening to that over and over and over again, like the doo-wop songs. And yeah. Stuff. The thing that's really been making me feel old here recently is uh, the kids refer to uh, the late the late 1900s is what they call it now. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, though. Well, I just mentioned Back to the Future, and I, I literally just watched it with my six-year-old. Um, uh, and my older boy has already seen it, but he watched it with us, too. And we did the math, and we realized that if that movie took place today, uh, he'd go back to 1994. <laughs> man what a bummer <laughs> yeah. i was like 1994 i remember lining up at the cd store to buy the new pearl jam album that's, <laughs> that's classic rock now yeah. speaking exactly. speaking of uh you just said pearl jam uh, what what kind of records and stuff were spinning around the house uh like then or now both both um the, I was I was really at that age I was really into the local scene. There was um there was a record label out of Hamilton, Ontario called Sonic Onion, and and as long as you were on that record label, I loved your band. <laughs> um, uh, it was just because they because they were smart. They threw these all ages shows. There was a there was a club in downtown Toronto called Lee's Palace, and uh, every Saturday afternoon. There'd, there'd be a bill of like six bands and they'd only play for like 20 minutes, half an hour each, but it was like a thing you could do. It was underage. They didn't have the bar open yet. Um, and then all those same bands would play at night. But, uh, but my friends and I used to just go every Saturday. Like that's just, you didn't even talk about it. You're just like, <laughs> yeah, you'd I meet got up you. in line at Lee's. Um, so, so I really liked a lot of the local stuff and, uh, uh, you know, uh, like uh, as far as like more broadly established stuff, I was a big. Uh, I loved Bad Religion. Bad Religion were my were were like my favorite band at that age, and um, you know all the sort of, you know, I guess you'd call it alternative rock of the time. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I loved Pavement, uh, Change of Heart were a local Toronto band that I must have seen ten or fifteen times. That still to this day. If you ask me about like it's one of the best live shows, they put on an unbelievable show. Just so much energy. Um, I, I probably still listen to a lot of that stuff today, or a lot of the stuff that's sort of like a descendant of that stuff. Right now, I've been listening a lot to. Do you know a band called Wednesday? Not familiar. I don't know where they're from, uh, but uh, you know somehow, somehow the algorithm. F f introduced me in them and and uh and i've been really digging them a lot they're actually coming to toronto in a, a couple of weeks and i'm gonna go see them wednesday wednesday yeah okay uh, rat saw god is the name of their record and it's okay. very kind of like 90s you know i mean they're kids they're they're like you know yeah i'm, I'm gonna be the oldest guy at the show <laughs> 90s is a very weird time for music. I mean, just the the big genre, 90s alternative. It has the it's a, just a weird label. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, a lot of stuff didn't really mix in. <laughs> but I'm trying I'm trying to think like really because I'm trying to concentrate on the era of like you know the stuff that you contacted me about. And like I remember that summer. I went I went to see the Beastie Boys that summer. That's very 90s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought it was so cool. <laughs> and it, I mean, it actually was. It was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like I went to a couple of Lollapaloozas. I'm a I'm a walking time capsule. Ever did you ever have any interest or starting your own band or picking up an instrument or anything? I I played I played in like high school bands and stuff. I played drums. I played guitar. Uh, I'll still fool around with it a little bit. I feel like the 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 only honest answer I can give is. A, it's like I'm like the best guy around the campfire. I'm not I'm not good enough to actually do it, but like you know. I'm, Out of your I, friend circle, you could do the best. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, Amos, this is something I'd ask everyone just because you never know what scared you as a kid. Scared as a kid. Okay. So, movie wise, which is, I know, not the only thing, but like right. I remember so distinctly seeing Candyman. 
the original Candyman movie. My older brother was watching it and I was probably too young to watch it, but I remember watching it with him. And I remember that being the first time I'd been so scared by a movie that I don't know if you remember it, but I do. <laughs> you, you say you say Candyman three times in the mirror, right? Mm-hmm. And I remember lying in bed being so freaked out and I couldn't sleep until I did it. And I got out of bed and I went to my mirror and I said Candyman three times just to prove to myself that it was just a movie. <laughs> and that was one of the more fitful uh, nights of sleep that I ever had. <laughs> the anxiety um, between the second and third Candyman. Is- yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but uh, but I wasn't like I wasn't a kid who was scared of the dark, and I wasn't scared of like spiders or anything like that. Like, um, yeah, no, I I was pretty good with that stuff. I, but I did have an active imagination. I I I was I was good at I was good at concocting and really living out terrible scenarios. <laughs> if that makes sense, you know. Yeah. It'd be oh, like, too much, I could, I could, you know. <laughs> Man, if I just did this wrong, then I could set the house on fire. And if I set the house on fire, and then you just like, I could, I could take that story to all of its logical conclusions. Yeah, pretty well. Oh, I can relate to that. Um, yeah. When uh, so you just mentioned, you know, basically all your family is involved in the business, but with yourself personally, do you have a a light bulb or eureka moment you can point to to where you were like, okay, I'm gonna give this a try. Maybe this is for me too. Hundred percent. So, I, weirdly. It happened when I already kind of sort of had a career. So I started when I was about four years old. And I think it was one of those um, sort of age old things like my mom couldn't get a babysitter. And so she had to take me along to an audition. And they said, hey, we need a kid. (laughs) Uh, And that was like my first job. Um, So I'd been doing it for a long time, but I didn't really take it very seriously. I remember, you know, going into auditions and stuff and when you're a kid that, you know, you do, you do the scene, but they always want to talk to you and get a sense of your personality because a kid, you know, with, with some notable exceptions, kids don't really act. They just are kind of like the right kid for the part. And I remember always, they'd say, well, do you like acting? And I'd always say, no, (laughs) Say, I want to, I want to do this when I grow up. I want to do that when I grow up, whatever, whatever my sort of obsession of the week was. Um, And then when I was about 12 or 13, I went to see a production at the Stratford Theatre Festival, which is in Ontario, uh, of Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett. And it starred Tom McCamus and Stephen Wilmette. It just blew me away. It just blew me away. I just, I remember sitting, I remember sitting in the theatre as everybody was leaving and I just stayed in my seat Mm. because I just, it, it had been such a moving sort of profound thing for me. And that was kind of the point where I went like, okay, well, I do this thing, but maybe I want to like actually learn how to do it and actually, you know, make a project of it, make a study of it. Mm -hmm. So my attitude towards it changed at that point. Um, And it only probably took me 10 or 15 years to figure out how to do it properly. (laughs) When uh, did you start on stage after that? Uh, a couple of years later, a couple of years later, I finally got to, to get up on stage. What about your f- very first performance? Do you remember that? Did, did it go smoothly, pants fall down or anything? <laughs> I remember doing, well, actually, I guess I had been on stage a little bit earlier. I did a production of the Snow Queen, like the Hans Christian Andersen story. Mm. And I remember uh, at, at, at the at the De Maurier Theater in Toronto, which is now called the On Wave Theater, I think, in case there's any Torontonians listening. Um, and... Um, uh, I was about 14 or 15, something like that. And there was a girl I had a crush on and she'd come to the show. I knew she was there. So I was going to, I was going to peacock a little bit in a <laughs> bow. I did like a fancy bow and I fell just ass over tea kettle. Uh, <laughs> just like right in front of everybody. Got the biggest laugh that had been gotten all night. Um, so, <laughs> so never peacock kids. <laughs> Don't do it. Did you ever go on a date with her? Oh no, she was like four years older than me. Okay. Like, it's like, it was it was already uh, completely out of the. This realm. is all in your head. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, did you ever have to to deal with or overcome stage fright at all? Was that ever an issue? Not in the traditional sense of stage fright. I don't think. Um, I uh, I never really got that nervousness, and I never really like. 
I guess partially because of growing up on film sets and growing up in an environment, like it was actually kind of a comfortable zone for me. Mm. I certainly suffered the equivalent of stage fright in like my everyday life with some regularity, but not in that era. But I will say that for certain periods, and I think that most actors, if they're being honest, would agree with this. There were certain periods where my work wasn't very good because I had gotten really self-conscious. So it's not exactly stage fright, but I got really into like watching myself and like, am I doing a good, good enough job? And is this working? And I was never scared to do it. I was always actually maybe even over eager to do it. But at certain sort of junctures, that would happen. And you'd have right. to kind of relearn how to do it. And um, I don't know if that's unique to acting. I know a lot of actors who have had that experience. I don't, never really having done anything else. I don't know if that happens in other careers. I think I learned to prepare better. I think it, it stopped just being like, oh, well, I'll just sort of learn the lines and say them and it'll be good or it won't. And and I actually sort of started to, you know, learn about like putting some thought into like, oh, well, you know, this story starts here and it ends here. And I actually have to figure out how to get to those places. Mm -hmm. And I learned to have more respect for the other people too. Like, right. You learn to respect what a director does, what a cinematographer does, what the crew guys do. You learn to actually understand that it's, um, it's a mosaic and every piece is important. The more you know about it, the more you kind of respect that. And the more you sort of find your niche, right? Like I'm not, I'm not responsible for all of this. I'm responsible for this piece of it. So let me get good at that. Mm -hmm. I like that. Just uh, speaking of Toronto, I've spoken with plenty of folks from Toronto. It just seems, uh, especially in the era that you're talking about and that you're in, that Toronto was a hub for the voice acting scene, that everything Absolutely. was kind of concentrated there. Like, you know, I spoke with Allison Court, Ron Rubin, Lawrence Bain, people you probably know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, what was it about Toronto during that time? Do you think it was just an influx of talent or was that just the only game in town for voice acting? Yeah, I don't really know too much about the history of it. I mean, I feel like uh, we had something in Canada called the National Film Board. And they were very pioneering in a lot of early animation techniques. So as a result, there were a lot of good animators. And uh, so there was a company called Nelvana that probably came up in the conversations. Like, I know Ali Court was there. I know, you know. And uh, out of the fact that the animation was happening there, I guess it just made more sense to have the actors there as well, the voice actors mm. there as well. And in the early days of voice acting... It, it, we had quite a vibrant sort of classical theater scene in and around Ontario. And th those, that older generation, like they were the first ones to do a lot of the, the cartoons because mm. they had those, they had those great deep, you know, British trained voices and they could do all kinds of stuff. And so you'd always record cartoons on Mondays because Monday was the off day from the theater festivals. And so I, I sort of have always kind of attributed it to that. Um, uh, you know, because I remember once somebody telling me, and I don't know if this is entirely true or not, it's not coming from like a, it's just an anecdotal thing, but somebody telling me that like when you go to the Disney offices in LA or whatever, like 30% of the animators are Canadian. Like there's just a long tradition of, of animators. And so mm. it kind of made sense that the voice stuff would follow. I mean, to this day, like, you know, Paw Patrol and all the stuff. Yeah. Like, parents are probably sick of hearing about that's all still done here <laughs> so was it your goal personally to break into the voice side of things or did it just happen naturally it just kind of happened naturally i think um if you are a kid who is articulate and i and i mean that in a like a physiological sense right not necessarily like you know uh, in a an expression way but if you if you have a clear voice and you don't you know say your r's and your w's weird or anything like that like, <laughs> and they need kids who can do it really clearly and um and i learned to read really early so i could read the scripts and uh so yeah like i mean that's that's kind of your best way to wiggle into that industry is to start doing it as a kid so generally speaking on the projects that you the voice some of the vo voice work that you did would you say it was more common in those days for the actors to record uh communally sort of in the same room off uh 
playing off each other. Yeah, I feel like the change started to happen in like the mid '90s. Up until that, you did a lot of stuff communally, and then at some point, I guess they just figured you know it was cheaper and faster to do it with just people coming in one at a time. You know, I don't want to sound like you know, old man shakes his fist at cloud, but I think something's lost in that, right? Like I I I, I prefer doing it communally. I haven't had anyone else say otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that seems to be the nature of the industry though, right? Like, mm, yeah. uh, you know, you know post COVID, we, we don't even do in-person auditions anymore. Everything is just, you know, you set up your little camera and your little lights in your attic or in your closet or in your wherever. And uh, it's increasingly more and more siloed. Mm. Um, Maybe that's cyclical. Maybe that'll change. I don't know. Well, uh, with how easy it is with technology and all, you you never know. It may it may not go back just because of just how accessible everything is now, and the internet's only getting faster and more invasive. Totally. <laughs> and, you know, if if I run if I run a you know a, a film company or a television studio, like why do I want to spend money renting a space to hold auditions in and paying people to to run the auditions if I can just say. Send us your tapes. Maybe we'll watch them. Yeah, and, ju and just on just thinking uh, on the subject of auditions, what was what's the most nerve wracking audition you've ever had? Gosh, I don't know. Um, again, it's kind of like a comfort zone for me. Um, I guess you know the nerve wracking ones are the like the sort of the the further along. It's not a particular one, but it's like the further along you get in the stage. You know, it's like first one you're just kind of throwing the dice. Then you get a call back, and this kind of feels a little bit important. And depending on the project, maybe you go to a second or a third or a fourth call back. And with each increasing one, it starts to feel like a little bit extra, a little bit extra, a little bit extra. Um, mm -hmm. So so I think that's, you know, I think one of the things that happens when you learn to have a bit more of a methodology and you learn to get a little bit better at it is, like, you get better at reminding yourself, like, these are all the same things, you know? It's like you listen to a, like a baseball player's talk and and they'll say like it's really important to remember that you're you know the bottom of the first and the bottom of the ninth you're still doing the same thing right even though it feels like the bottom of the ninth meets means more <laughs> so I want to ask you uh, Amos about something that you worked on Tales from the Crypt Keeper it was two episodes I believe oh wow yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was just curious if you were a fan of the HBO series at all oh man I love that show I. I could run into the other room right now and show you my <laughs> my DVD box set of that show that I bought during COVID. <laughs> I used to love that show. That show, there was an amazing late night programming thing um, on CBC, which is the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And um, on Friday nights, like after 10 p.m. or whatever, so when I was like, you know, an adolescent and a young teenager, you could watch an episode of HBO Tales from the Crypt, and then an episode of the Larry Sanders show. Mm. And then after that, they do a kids in the hall marathon till like four in the morning. <laughs> Man, that's good stuff. It is great. It was great. <laughs> yeah. I is like, I don't know. I, I, I take it. You were a fan of the show. Oh yeah. The, the meatloaf episode really stands out in my head really strongly. He's he's a he's a grave digger, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know why, but that's one that like has really stuck with me. Um, and the and the opening this is one of the all time great openings. John Cassier, the Crypt Keeper, actually does the intro to the podcast here because I had him on and I I bullied him into doing it. Basically, <laughs> that's fantastic. I know I was on your website. You've had some killer guests, man. Thanks, man. I I just ask and cross my fingers, really. <laughs> I just hope they say yes. I wanted to ask you about the Ghastly Grinner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was uh, directed by Ron Oliver. Uh, sure was. So, what do you call about working with Ron? It's been a just been a crazy week here because I just recorded with um, Lisa Schrag, who played Mary Lou Maroney in uh, Prom Night Two, yeah. by Ron Oliver. Then we got you know Ron Oliver for uh, Are You Afraid of the Dark? Or just giving Ron all kind of free plugs this week. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I don't know how many are you afraid of the darks he did, but it's got a be, lot. Yeah, it's got to be in the dozens, right? Yeah, like, and goosebumps. Yeah, uh, Ron. Uh, so okay, so again, my weird Canadian upbringing. In addition to being a writer and a director, Ron was an interstitial host on YTV, 
which again, if you have Canadian listeners, they'll remember YTV, which was you know, youth, youth television. I think it was called. And um, in between the shows, they had what they called PJs, program jockeys. And Ron was one of them. So when I did that show with him, I was like, oh, my God, it's PJ Ron. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like it was PJ Ron from when I was like seven, you know, like he had a bit with like a stuffed duck that he did. I don't remember all of it. Uh, but then he was a ball, man. Like that was like. I was a comic book kid. I loved comic books. And so we got to hang out in a comic book store and he's a comic book dude. In between takes, we just like go through the racks and talk about comic books. And he was, he was great. And I had just, I always remember this. And we did like a little, uh, are you afraid of the dark reunion a couple of years ago? And I, t I told him this story and um, I had just discovered the flaming lips, the band, the flaming lips. I'd seen them that summer and I, I they blew me away. And they became my favorite band. And so on the last day of filming, he wore, he had a Flaming Lips t-shirt. And I was like, that's the coolest that a grown-up has ever been. <laughs> you know, to do that. Um, yeah. And we played, there's a scene where we had to, I had to like smash my bedroom, tear stuff off the walls and stuff. And uh, we shot it uh, like SOC. They weren't going to run sound on it. And he brought a boom box in and he blasted Head Like a Hole by Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> uh, so that I, to like work me up and get me to tear stuff down so yeah we had a good old time it was fun do you happen to have the ghastly grinner comic laying around anywhere i don't i don't um uh have a copy of it for a while i had they made me a t-shirt with the cover of it on it and they gave that to me as a gift at the end um but i think you know a few hundred washes later, it was just a gray t-shirt. So all the, all, everything had come off of it. But, uh, so that's all I ever had. I know Ron has a copy, but I don't know if it's the, the ghastly grinner copy. A few people have done reproductions over the years. I know that because I've signed a couple for people, mm. uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, I have no idea what would have happened to, you'd have to track down like the props department. What is the coolest prop that you've kept from a project? I'll be honest, I don't really keep a lot of stuff. Mm. Um, it's almost like a kind of a superstitious thing. It's almost kind of like a, um, if you hold on to stuff, then then there won't be another job down the line. Mm. I somehow got that idea into my head at some point, and so I I, I don't tend to keep stuff to be honest. Gotcha. Except yeah. for, I've I've kept wardrobe. You know, sometimes like they put you into like a really nice suit, and then, <laughs> and then they 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 tailor it to you, and you're like, well, I'll 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 buy this from you. Like it's you know, <laughs> it's a nice suit. <laughs> it's it's tailored to fit me. It's, right. <laughs> so was it the uh was the, the are you afraid of the dark opportunity? Did that lead to goosebumps? Were they related at all? I don't know that they would have been related. Um, I think that was just it happened to be like a concurrent thing. Um. Are You Afraid of the Dark shot in Montreal and Goosebumps shot in Toronto, but they were both cast out of Toronto. Okay. So uh, I don't, I, and, and there's certainly like, I think if you were to do a Venn diagram of actors who worked on both, there'd be a heck of a lot of overlap. Right, but, yeah, there uh, definitely is. Yeah, um, but I don't think they were related particularly in any way. So what are your memories when you reflect back on the Haunted Mask? Anything stick out about the shooting to you? I mean, you know, hanging out in a graveyard in the middle of the night with smoke machines going is kind of it's like kind of a cool thing to do. It's yeah. kind of neat. I do that um, on a weekend right now. Really? There you go, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. It, I have sort of learned in the intervening years that the book series wasn't actually that popular until the show came out, which I didn't know. Um I would have been old enough already that like, I think, I think I had read some of the fear street books, mm -hmm. but I didn't know goosebumps. And so you don't really know. It's so funny when you're doing something and it was like, it was the first episode, right? Yeah. So you don't really know what you're working on until later. It, it still kind of blows my mind that of all of the things that I've been in, that's probably the number one that people reach out or people you know, send an email or whatever uh, to say like, hey, I, this was really important to me. And um, you don't know that at the time. Right. Um, so, I, you know, I just feel pretty lucky to have been a part of it, you know. And I think a lot of it just has to do with the fact that like genre fans, horror fans particularly tend to be 
among one the more dedicated and two like the nicer and cooler people and or in sci-fi <laughs> yeah and because i guess for a certain generation that was a bit of a gateway yeah um so but it's dumb luck man it's dumb luck um i'll t but i will give you i will give you the memory that i that i hold the strongest which was which was not actually during the filming it was doing adr which is when you go in and you do um i mean i'm sure you know but in, in case anyone right, doesn't right. when ahead. you go in afterward and you and you do additional dialogue or you you know like the wind was blowing too loud on set so like they couldn't understand what you say and you say your dialogue again and there was a scene where we were, we were going through our halloween candy and like throwing out what we didn't want and keeping what we did and and they and they asked me to say something in there they just needed to cover something and and so as 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 my character uh, threw something over my shoulder i said i hate mints and and then and everybody laughed really hard i don't know why but everybody laughed really hard and that actually became like a running goosebumps joke that in several episodes of goosebumps over the entirety of the season a character will say i hate mints Wow, I'm, I did not know that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna have to go look it up. <laughs> that was I, I. No, I've never tested this theory, but that's um, one of the producers told me that uh, when wow. I was doing a different episode. They said, "Hey, we still use that joke." Have you kept in contact with any of your co-stars from back in the day? Ghost of Goosebumps, Already Afraid of the Dark. Uh, I think I've sort of run into people from time to time, but uh, but not in a particularly active way. It's a pretty peripatetic thing. I know John White, who was in Haunted Mask, he and I worked together again a couple of years later, and then he ended up being good pals with another actor I was working with, so I saw him for a drink or something, you know. But uh, uh, no, it's one of the weird things about this industry in general, right? Whether you're doing a play or you're shooting a TV show or a movie, like you spend a very short but very intense period of time with people. Yeah. You usually build a lot of memories, and then maybe you don't see them ever again. And even more weird, those memories, at least the on-screen memories, are documented for everyone to watch <laughs> forever. Right? Right? <laughs> yeah. uh, but then the flip side of it is sometimes you run into somebody that you haven't seen for 20 years, and it's like feels really comfortable because you, you know, you did a thing together. Right. And, you know, doing a podcast like this, I... I'll only reach out to folks that I have been a fan of or have some sort of memory to my childhood. But of course you get a lot of requests. Right. So I, uh, when I tease that you were coming on here, one of the main questions I get is you got to ask him if he's ever heard from Catherine Long since, because Carly Beth is kind of underground and no one knows where she is. <laughs> so through an intermediary, uh, she said, hi, a little while ago. Um, uh, funnily enough, I did a, a did a, 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 a another podcast talking about this stuff, and and they had said, "Hey, we've actually reached out to her, and she's not doing the show, but we told her you were coming on, and she said to say hi." And uh, and so I know she runs a ballet school in BC, um, and that's that's about it. Um, but I know that no one has ever heard ever again from Catherine Short. But I do think it's important that we all take time to recall. <laughs> Both Catherine Short and Catherine Long started in the Haunted Mask. <laughs> Rest in peace, Catherine Short. Yeah. It's like if, <laughs> you know, if Jack Black and Jack White ever do a movie. Yeah. Like that, really. So, like I said, you got some big hits from my childhood personally. Magic School Bus being one. Yeah. Arnold was probably the most relatable kid because, you know, you never want to be. I should have stayed home. And my totally. wife said, make sure you tell Amos that uh, she's a first grade teacher. So she has to watch the Magic School Bus every week. <laughs> And all of her kids' favorite kid is Arnold. <laughs> oh, oh, that's nice. That's a heck of a good show. <laughs> it really was. Like yeah. I said, like I, even if I wasn't in it, you know, that's a heck of a good show. Was that just a typical audition too? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think at that time, like at that time, the voice acting circle, especially for kids, was was pretty small. So, like, you, you I, I imagine, I don't remember auditioning for it. I imagine I did, but it was a small enough circle that I might not have. You know, that it might just have been like, you know, oh, he knows how to do a squeaky, nerdy voice. And, and <laughs> you know, because every, every kid on that show also was on like five other shows. Mm -hmm. like, that was uh, Stewie Stone and uh, 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 Daniel, who was also one of the, the Midnight Society kids. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, who else was on that show? Uh, 
Lisa Yamamoto, who did a bunch of shows. Like, so it was like a lot of, you know, it was, it, it was a bunch of heavy hitters. Yeah, well, heavy hitters. We were 12, but you know. <laughs> Billy Madison. Yeah. <laughs> How did that happen? And did you, well, were you with so Adam Sandler? Like? like one of those things that I was talking about, like that was one of those, like the first audition I have no recollection of the second audition. I have no recollection of, but I really strongly remember the third audition because Adam Sandler was there. Oh, wow. Right. Like they'd gotten it down to like two or three kids for each role. And then we went downtown to this building, at Spadina in Richmond and, and he was there and, you know, you had to meet him and he wasn't, he wasn't Adam Sandler in the way he is now, but he was already on SNL, you know, right. and he was already, he'd already done the lunch lady song. And, <laughs> uh, you know, so like, I remember that one for sure. Like that's, that was sort of nerve wracking. Um, he was just a lovely dude. Just really nice. You know? And again, any like, scenes with him. Sorry. Yeah. 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 I had a bunch of scenes with him. Um, uh, almost all of them, I think. Um, and he was just, you know, again, he, like no one knew what was going to happen with that yet, you know? Right. Uh, and then it ended up being a big hit and then, you know, and here we are. And just timeline wise, I, uh, Billy Madison, that was prior to Happy Gilmore and the Sandler run, right? So Billy Madison was like the first It's the domino. first one, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's the first one. And I remember getting to hang out with Norm MacDonald. Oh, rest in peace. My favorite comedian. Peace. Yeah. Uh, and, and could not have been a nicer guy. Like just hung out, talked with all the kids. It was funny. It was this great dude. And 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 again, like he he wasn't even doing Weekend Update yet. Like he was, he he was just another guy, you know, another mm -hmm. bit player who just you know they gave him a part in the movie. And and I remember on that being so starstruck because Steve Buscemi had a cameo in it, and Reservoir Dogs had just come out. And I was, you know, the perfect age for Reservoir Dogs. Mm -hmm. And I walked into the makeup trailer and Steve Bush and Mr. Pink was there, you know. And I, I was like, oh, my God. And then, you know, he just turned around and introduced himself like the sweetest guy in the world, you know. <laughs> Hello, right. fellow actor. Yeah. <laughs> hey, how's it going? <laughs> what would you say is the best acting advice you've received and who gave it to you? There's a Canadian actor named Barry Flatman. Uh, who's, uh, um, you know, long and storied career, lovely guy. And um, about 10 years ago or so, I started teaching acting and I didn't know what I was doing. I just been I offered this job to teach. And, uh, you know, I had kids at this point and was like, well, I need some sort of steady income. And, and he and I were working together and, and I, I said, you know, I'm starting to teach and I don't, I don't know how to talk about this. You know, I like, you know, I, I can parrot my teachers, but I, and he said, well, the best thing you can say to a young actor is uh, what you are is enough. Mm. And it, it not only resonated with me as a way to, to as, a, as a as a way into teaching, but it also was like just excellent advice that I sort of thought like, man, why didn't anybody say that to me 15 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> right. It was good advice. Yeah. So as a teacher, what would you say is the most common pitfalls you see from young actors? that they fall into? Um, they want to jump to performance right away. They want to do the fun part, you know? And I get it, right? Like, nobody becomes an actor so that they can sit at home and, you know, do their homework, do their studying. But it, it actually makes the end thing easier to do. But everybody wants to... Everybody just kind of wants to go like, yeah, yeah, no, 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 let's just do the scene. Mm. You know? And I get it. I, I was the same way. I still actually have that instinct. But yeah, I think young actors want to jump to performance right away. And it's like, just ease up, take a look at it, build a bit of a myth methodology, and you'll you'll be able to be far more consistent. Mm. It's like sports. You know, you might watch the game on Sunday, but you don't see the six days of practice. <laughs> it, exactly. Exactly. Right? You don't. Um, <laughs> one of the stories I tell students all the time is, um, I, I had this uh, buddy that I worked with for a while. I was when I was in theater school. I was working at a, a rehearsal studio, um, uh, in, just off Broadway in New York, and uh, you know, it was a place where people could come and like, you know, rent a studio for a while and hold auditions or do a writing session if they were songwriters, whatever that kind of thing. And the 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 manager was this guy named Andy, and Andy was from Worcester, Massachusetts, and he grew up, uh, I think, in a like a big. A Catholic family, a lot of kids, not a lot of money. 
uh, and he was a huge Celtics fan. And uh, but he'd never been to a game, you know, the family mm-hmm. didn't have money. And I think he graduated high school. He got really good marks or something. So his dad bought him a ticket to go see the Celtics. And so he took the bus into Boston, and went down to the gardens. And he said he showed up like four hours early. And he's like waiting for them to open the doors because he just wanted to really soak it all in, you know. And this is this is the golden age, right? Like this is Larry Bird. Oh, yeah. And, and so he's walking around, taking in the smells and they're setting up the popcorn and they're doing all that. And he looks out on the court and Larry Bird's out on the court and Larry Bird's got five racks of like, you know, 50 or 60 basketballs. And he just goes to each rack and he shoots all 50 and walks to the next rack, shoots all 50. Doesn't look, doesn't, I'm not paying attention, just goes to the next rack. He does all five racks and then he takes off, I guess, to like shower, prep, get ready for the game, whatever it is. But as Andy tells the story, then the game starts and he, he realizes those five spots where the racks were, that's where Bird took every shot from. He only shot from one of those five spots. Mm-hmm. And, you, and like, and so to me, when you say like, you don't see what goes on the other six days, well, that's what the actor does, right? Like, cause then you're in the game, the pressure's on, it's scary. But as long as you get to your spot, that's all you have to think about. Let me just get to that spot and my body will take care of the rest. Right. That's, you know, I love that story. Yeah. Like, Shot clocks down to one second. They're going to dribble to uh, muscle memory, wherever their body shot the ball of best. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Not that there's any history of basketball in Carolina, but you know. <laughs> we, we, we do okay. <laughs> so uh, most challenging project you've worked on, is there one that you've lost sleep over? I think when I was younger, it was virtually everything. You know, I was talking earlier about going through these phases where you get self-conscious and where you have, you know, imposter syndrome to use the parlance of the day. Um, And there was a phase where everything felt like that. Every, everything felt like so much pressure Um, uh, that I sort of lost sleep over everything. Mm. Um, And then uh, I kind of came through the other side of that and, you know, learned that it's just a job. And, you know, it's just playing make-believe and it's, we talk about it in very like ridiculous language. You know, every time I read an article or something that talks about how brave an actor was in a scene or something, I kind of go like, well, they didn't throw themselves on a grenade. Like, you know, <laughs> they're playing make-believe and look, I've dedicated my whole life to it. And I, I think about it all the time and I think about the mechanics of it. And I, but like, you know, it's not actually that big a deal. It's not right. doctors. Without, it's not doctors without borders, you know. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, there was probably a phase, and I think a lot of actors go through this where everything becomes that. And right. I think, I think for a lot of young actors, like that's almost encouraged, right? Because it it keeps up a certain mystique, and it keeps up a, you know, there's this sort of like whatever the actor version of being an edge lord is becomes like a huge you know draw for people um so yeah but 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 no nothing in particular when i think back on it nothing in particular was that big a deal it just felt mm. like it at the time um and i and I, I think that's sort of a healthier outlook on it now mm. i've done some terrible performances that i would love <laughs> to take back but you know hey we all have regrets yeah <laughs> So can you recall a time where a director has given you maybe a, a note or some input on a scene or a character and then it, it clicked for you? I got a great note once uh, doing an episode of like a, a police procedural. And I was playing um, this guy and his fiance had been murdered and he was brought in as a suspect, and but he was innocent. And, and uh, the director came up to me after the first take and he said, hey, that was really good, but I, like, I'm absolutely sure that you're innocent. And I said, yeah, that's, I am. You know, like that's, the character's innocent. And he said, yeah, 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 but I need the audience at home to not be sure. Mm. And I was like, and all of a sudden, a whole thing about storytelling clicked in my head. Mm-hmm. And I was like, right, my job is to be a you know, I mentioned earlier being a part of it, being a cog in a machine. My job isn't just about my character. My job's about this whole thing. So it's like, okay, well, if if he's not guilty of the crime and, and the script says he's not, so I can't pretend that that's the case. But like, he could have been cheating on her. He could have been, what, you know, whatever it is. Like, there there could be a reason that he was nervous. Right. 
And uh, I don't know, that sticks with me as like a, 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 you know, understanding story is part of the job. Right, right. I thought that was great advice. You know, like, yeah, I just, I need the audience to think you did. <laughs> like, they have to not be sure. Otherwise, like, why are they going to keep watching the rest of the episode? <laughs> Sounds like a David, yeah. some David Lynch advice. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, David Lynch might just say, mm, I don't know what's happening in this scene. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's maybe more... there'll be a rabbit. Um, <laughs> That'll confuse everybody. I love David Lynch. He's one of my favorite films. <laughs> Just David Lynch is hilarious because my wife has never watched Twin Peaks and we sat down to uh, watch it the other day and we're watching the first episode. She thinks it's going to be like 30 minutes, 45 minutes. It gets to 60 minutes and she's like, geez. And then after it's over, I just look at her. She looks at me and goes, I have no idea what's going on here. <laughs> you know, something that my wife and I talk about with some regularity actually is like how weird it is that that was on ABC. I can't believe it. Do you know what I mean? Like that was on like, that was on like cheers or whatever. I know it wasn't cheers, but like, it was like, yeah. you know, like what a weird thing that happened just because of a weird confluence of things. And like, could you imagine <laughs> that today? Could you imagine turning on network television and seeing, I don't know, like, you know, an Ari Aster TV show or something. Right. Like, it's, it's just weird. Well, Amos is something I like to ask everyone as well. Have you ever cool. had an experience that you would consider supernatural or paranormal? No. Or an event you can't explain if you don't like those words. No, no, it's not that I don't like those words. Uh, what you hear in my voice is like, I was always one of those people who like, I wanted one. <laughs> I was like, I want to see a ghost. I want to like, and every time someone tells a story about it, I'm like, oh, cool. But it's never happened to me. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm kind of open to it, but no. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> yeah, well, increasingly with age, I become more and more of like a boring pragmatist. But... <laughs> yeah. And then I started to realize that everyone I knew who was telling me about these amazing stories were also the people I knew who took a lot of acid. So, uh, you know. That's one way to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> well, Amos, just to put a bow on this thing here, uh, what's on the horizon for you? Is there anything you can share? Anything without getting in trouble? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, I'm prepping a play right now. I'm going to go do a play called An Inspector Calls. Um, in St. Jacob's, Ontario. Uh, it's a, a great old play that stands up really, really well. And uh, and then other than that, it's just always the hustle. That's sort of what this gig is. And uh, um, I don't know. I'll have a different answer tomorrow, maybe. <laughs> maybe they'll fire Hopefully. me from the play, you know? Like, I don't know. <laughs> you could get a job when we leave off this call here. Right? <laughs> Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you, man. And like I said, yeah, you big too, fan. man. Thank you so much for reaching out. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you. And when I get this edited, I'm pretty. I'll send you a link. Maybe one day down the road, we'll get you and Ron together, and we'll do a little powwow. Uh, that'd be great. That'd be great. <laughs> he uh, owes you after all the lip service. He does, especially this week. I've already, I'm about to message him after this. I'm like, man, I, can, I need some royalties or something. <laughs> Amos, you have a good rest of your night, man. I appreciate you. Thanks, you too. <laughs>